Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm a member of Derby Makers, which is um, an eclectic group of people who turn up at our host, um, where we live, inverted commas, at the Radio Communications Museum of Great Britain, which you won't have heard of because it's not yet open in Derby. Um, and it's got basically about two rooms this size full of radio gear. And there's another room somewhere else with the same amount. So it's got quite a lot of exhibits. Uh, we've moved in because our normal home has been heritage lottery funded, upgraded, trashed, rebuilt, everything. So we needed a temporary home. High altitude balloons, to give them their normal name, or HABs, are a hobby. They're a fun thing to do. They're aimed at getting um, youngsters and non-technical people involved in technology. They're based around Raspberry Pis. Correction, the ones we do are based around Raspberry Pis, but if your hardware prefer preference is for something else, that's fine. You can do what you like. We have exhibit A, which is a Bakewell pudding, <laughs> which was um, because you always send these things up with a Raspberry Pi camera, wide angle lens, taking nice pictures of the curvature of the earth. And a friend of mine sent one up with a Raspberry pudding on it because someone else sent one up with a model of um, a US astronaut recently. So there was a little bit of who can do what. And it went up. And the electronics failed. He has no idea where it went. The, all the telemetry failed. Um, no latitude, longitude, no height, no receiving real-time telemetry, which is what we all depend on. Um, it's gone somewhere. <laughs> so if you find a box about that big that says, please ring this number, £10 reward, <laughs> please do. <laughs> He'll be very interested. It did make the local BBC news with Radio Derby and because of that it actually made the real BBC news the six o'clock news one evening I'm told. The school is overjoyed at the amount of publicity they've got out of it. He's miffed because he's lost a payload but at the same time the children involved enjoyed it. Uh, the 10 milliwatts comes from the Civil Aviation Authority and Ofcom, not allowed to broadcast anything that might upset commercial aviation. Uh, this is a straight lift off the um, internet. The LoRaWAN spec, spec is for low power. Yeah, I think we meet that one. Um, wirelessly, yep. <laughs> battery, yes. There's, there's only certain, there's only one make of lithium batteries that works. Um, because as you'll see in a later slide, the temperatures that these things go up to is minus 50, minus 60, minus 70, depending on what the weather's doing. Uh, yes, it's an internet of things, and it does move. <laughs> and there's a, a connection, collection of LoRaWAN gateways around the country, which feed back to a, um, a central website, which in real time displays the telemetry that the various balloons are transmitting. 10,000 meters gets, which is roughly 30, 30 something thousand feet, is civil airliner territory. Uh, balloons go up higher, spy aircraft go up higher, but not as high as balloons. Uh, technically, this is not outer space. But if you were to pop out at that altitude without a spacesuit, you'd die very quickly. Um, we live right down the bottom. <laughs> and 100,000 feet is approximately 30 kilometers or 30,000 meters. Uh, though <laughs> the dates are on the next slide. Uh, Felix. Baumgartner, 2012, I think it was, 2013, something like that, got sponsored by Red Bull to go up um, as high as he possibly could. 
this is a generated image. I don't think there was a photographer up at that sort of altitude, sadly. Um, and jump. Uh, so he got up to 40 kilometers in 2012. Someone since has got up a bit higher, <laughs> just because they wanted to. <laughs> and the stratosphere is at th about 30 kilometers. Blackbird, the US retired um, reconnaissance aircraft, gets up to about 25 kilometers. Uh, temperature is minus 70-ish at the um, altitudes, beginning to come back up a bit, uh, but the pressure is almost zero at that altitude. So here you see exhibit A. <laughs> um, that's what a high altitude balloon looks like. They're about that big at ground level. <laughs> they go up to six to eight meters at full altitude before they burst. And then you hope that the payload and parachute and telemetry all work and you can track it and recover it and do it again. Uh, helium, bo helium bottle and you can see the telemetry is telling us that it's somewhere between 150 and 200 metres up. <laughs> and that's the latitude and longitude of Dave's back garden. <laughs> Typical configuration is a helium balloon with a parachute, um, either 18 inches, 2 foot or 3 foot, depending on how heavy your payload is. The one we're going to launch is going to be about 500 grams, so it's a 2 foot diameter um, parachute and you mostly you have one payload but if you want a second payload you, they're in series that distance is 10 meters well sorry that distance is 5 meters that distance is 10 meters um, there's no legislation around that it's just a pragmatic rule of thumb and it seems to work It's wonderful what you can find on Google. <laughs> Someone was incredibly lucky and got uh, a few s a second or so after burst. <laughs> and that's what your balloon looks like after it's gone pop. <laughs> Obviously, there's bits all over the place. Now, that, and I don't know how well that's visible at the back. Um, if it's not, sorry. Uh, you, that's Google Maps. <coughs> The central web website, Hab Hub, imaginative names we use. <laughs> um, various people have their own trackers, and you can see one there. You can see ours in Derby, someone else there, cluster around London, one over in the Malverns. Uh, I helped at a launch that was um, launched from the Malvern showground. It went up. And because of various factors which weren't obvious at the time but became obvious afterwards, um, the balloon did not go up as fast as we'd expected it to. And instead of it going up in a trajectory sort of like that, parachute and then down, it took a much greater time to get up to burst altitude. It burst, but it burst the far side of Basing Stoke from here, which is about down there, <laughs> and the parachute, we watched the payload disappearing out over the English Channel. <laughs> oh, we were, in, we were overjoyed at that one. Um, but there is some slight hope, because everybody always puts a, if you find this, there's a £10 reward, um, please ring this phone number on it. And um, a school did a launch about two years ago and recently the payload turned up on a beach in Denmark. <laughs> have no idea why it took that long. I'm, I'm not um, a climate, uh, a tides person. So this is what the telemetry things. There's a nice little icon that tells you you're on, under balloon flight. Uh, this is 
18 or 1900 meters latitude longitude time of clock in system and that's the view as you're going up you don't there are, there are two techniques used to transmit LoRaWAN and RTTY RTTY only sends um, bits in sense of altitude longitude latitude it doesn't send so slow, slow scan television pictures that LoRaWAN enables you to send one every four minutes. It does mean that whatever happens to your payload, you do get a view of what's going on and you can see much cl more clearly. The images are all written to the SD card, which is why that's one of the reasons why you want to recover your payload. Um, same flight, 42,000 meters, um, going well up nice curvature of space well above the clouds and you can see the picture is beginning to drop packets the telemetry is beginning to hit its limits and that's when it was recovered <laughs> some hours later and the person who was doing the flight he, he was going for the height out. He was going for the height record. That's the parachute. That's the fence. The road is here, and that's the recovery vehicle. Um, my understanding is that is an uncommon occurrence to be that neat. Um, they land on people's garages. They land on the roofs of mu uh, multi-storey buildings. They land in military ranges. <laughs> um, they have a mind of their own because they are at the whim of the weather on the day. Before you launch, you go to a particular website, put all your data into it, and it does some magic and it gives you a predicted route, which is surprisingly accurate. It's accurate um, on a sample of one launch that I've been involved with, um, accurate to within half a kilometer. Um, one of my colleagues is busy putting a SMS unit, single chip unit, in our payload uh, so that at about 1,800 or 3,000 feet, whatever it is, when it's got a, a cell, I, lo I love his optimism, when it's got a cell. I live in Derbyshire, up in the Peak District, there are places where you go, ooh, my phone's got a signal. Isn't that unusual? <laughs> um, but that's part of the fun. Ish. The central website, as I said, is called Hab Hub. It is an absolute font of all knowledge. It's been created by the com community. It is absolutely wonderful. You will lose, if you start getting interested, several evenings just reading it, understanding the jargon, uh, and beginning to understand how it all hangs together. This is um, one of the diagrams that says, this is what you will have to build, this is what you need, <laughs> and these are the key dependencies. So for someone like me who was an aerospace apprentice, that's great because it means that we can start generating pre-flight checklists, which um, my soul likes, because <laughs> that's what we used to do. Um, what All what it says is microcontroller. It doesn't matter which one you use. Some people prefer Arduinos. Some people prefer Raspberry Pis. Um, if you're feeling slightly rich and very lazy, we are for flight one. I insisted I wanted flight tested stuff because the unknown is us as a project team, not the electronics. Um, we bought a commercial unit called PITS, pie in the sky, and that simply does all of the stuff that you need. 
It is proprietary, but the software is available for free and you can muck around with it to your heart's content. Comes with a um, Pi Zero, so the weight of the payload is usually made up with Haribos um, because they're a nice packer, people like them, and if you've got lots of youngsters involved, the idea of eating a sweet that's been to space is something that they rather like, I'm told. Um, those are the batteries that work. We've, there's a, a gotcha around UPSs, UPS chips. The U-Blocks one, and they're quite a sensible firm in the because different project I was involved in, um, they don't block the um, functioning of the GPS chip when it goes, gets above a certain altitude. That used to be um, part of the arms munitions rules <laughs> so that you couldn't buy um, a chip and build your own ICBM. Uh, and you can have as much um, open source stuff as you want or as little as you want. Uh, my, one of my, let's say one of my colleagues is building one of, um, there's a uh, add-on board for the Raspberry Pi that only has a LoRaWAN chip. <laughs> um, so that's about 20 pounds or something. And he's trying to make that work. Obviously, it'll need a GPS and a radio unit and a couple of other bits. But his, uh, his goal is to see how cheap he can make it. I can't emphasize it enough. If you are interested, <laughs> be prepared to lose some serious time reading that website. It really is good. Right. Now, the slide I didn't put up because I was only doing it in the hotel room yesterday, is you can't just launch a balloon because you feel like it. You actually have to ask the Civil Aviation Authority t for a permission to launch. There is a form, of course. It turns out, I discovered yesterday, there are two forms. <laughs> um, I have no idea why there are two forms that you can use. Both of seem to ask the same thing, almost. One says, have you talked to the police? Um, so yesterday I kept trying our local police station on the phone. It was always engaged and I gave up after 10 times. <laughs> um, it's free, but then it generates what is, is um, in the trade called a NOTAM, Notification of Air Traffic Movement. And there is a wonderful website that pulls all of these off, drop, drops them on Google Maps, and shows you where they all are. Otherwise, you manually have to sit there with your own um, map, phys physically hand marking them all up. Um, the ICO do it, the um, CAA do it that way because most of their customers are the airlines, the MOD, and they've got all the processes set up. It's just hobbyists who don't. You have to submit the form one month before your flight and during the week before your flight you have to contact the department to check that you still have you, your assumption you've got permission to check that that assumption is still valid and that they're publishing an OTAN because what they do is say this is a three kilometre exclusion zone, be aware that um, there will be a balloon launch on this date between these times. You tell them the times. We've gone for 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. <laughs> um, I know Bristol uh, Balloon Festival has a big lift off at 5 or 6 in the morning because it's n the air is nice and stable then. Uh, I just None of us ever think that anyone will get up that early for this sort of stuff. So we, we don't do that. We do it during the day. But I've also requested a day the next weekend in case the weather does its usual British thing of you get up and you discover it's too windy or it's raining or typical summer problem. So, fingers crossed, 
we'll be doing this in a month. We, I had hoped that our first launch would come inside with today. That hasn't happened for all sorts of reasons, um, basically including holidays. Of, because it's a community project, it's not like running, being a project manager at work. I have to remind myself I am not a project manager, I'm a cat herder. <laughs> um, it operates differently. The people involved suddenly go on holiday, get ill, change their minds, all sorts of things that human beings do. It's quite good fun, really. Um, <laughs> but if you are interested, um, I'm running, at least I think I'm running a, a workshop tomorrow. And that's me done. Any questions? Thank you.